When most people think of marsupials, they will often think of the strange and even cute and comical creatures found in Australia today, like kangaroos, koalas and wombats. These only represent a small part of a much larger picture, as these mammals have a rich and quite surprising evolutionary history. In this video, we're going to be looking at the origins of the marsupial group of mammals and their closest kin, observing their evolution and distribution that dates back to the age of the dinosaurs. Mammals first evolved from creatures known as cynodonts during the Mesozoic era, colloquially known as the Age of Reptiles. It lasted from 252 to 66 million years ago, and reptiles dominated ecosystems across the planet, including the dinosaurs. Intense competition from reptiles forced mammals to stay small throughout the Mesozoic, with many being nocturnal. Despite their general small size, they were extremely diverse, adopting many different modes of life and methods of reproduction. As such, all modern mammals are descended from these Mesozoic survivors and can be broadly divided into three groups defined by their reproductive strategies. There are the monotremes, which lay eggs similar to reptiles, the placentals, which gestate in their mother's womb with the aid of a specialised temporary organ that lends the group their name, the placenta, and the focus of this video, the marsupials, which give birth to small, undeveloped young soon after conception that crawl into a pouch on their mother's stomach, which houses the teats and is where they grow and develop until they are independent enough to leave. Marsupials are members of a larger group of mammals that first evolved during the Mesozoic, the Metatherians. They are thought to have diverged from the group including the Placentals, the Eutherians, in the Jurassic period, roughly 160 million years ago. However, no uncontroversial fossils are known of either from this time. The oldest known definitive members of both groups are dated to the early Cretaceous from the Northern Hemisphere. They can be differentiated by the arrangement of their teeth. Metatherians have three pairs of premolars and four molars, whereas eutherians never have more than three molars. True marsupials, that is, members of the clade marsupialia, evolved from a group of metatherians. Whilst all marsupials are metatherians, not all metatherians are marsupials. Workers use complex data analyzing computer programs to compare the features of fossil elements shared across different species to determine their relations. Determining what is and is not a marsupial is very difficult, as metatherians are all thought to have had a reproductive strategy like that of marsupials, if not the very same. One of the oldest known definitive metatherians is Atoka theridium. Its name means Atoka small beast, after Atoka County, Oklahoma, near to where it was first discovered in the Antlers Formation, dated to the early Cretaceous, roughly 110 million years ago. Whilst it is only known from teeth, mammal teeth are very informative for cladistics and taxonomy, thanks to their variable shapes and purposes. From studying the unique features of these teeth, Atoka theridium can be allied with the most ancient of the metatherians in the order Delta Theroida. Their teeth are indicative of carnivorous habits. The genus Delta Theridium, meaning Delta small beast, from the Jadota formation of Mongolia, dated to the late Cretaceous, roughly 75 million years ago, at roughly 15 centimeters long, possibly shows direct evidence of preying on young dinosaurs. A juvenile skull of the dinosaur Archaeornithoides shows bite marks that match the teeth of Delta Theridium. From the early Jurassic to the middle of the Cretaceous, the main carnivorous mammals were the Eutriconodonts, an ancient extinct group that predates the marsupial placental split. This order included both the first gliding mammals, like Argentoconodon from early Jurassic Argentina, and the earliest known evidence of mammals preying on dinosaurs, with Repenomamus from early Cretaceous China feeding on juvenile Cetacosaurus. Despite this dominance, they significantly declined in the late Cretaceous for reasons that are unclear. One theory is that they were outcompeted by metatherians like Delta Theroids, either directly or gradually over time thanks to the radiation of flowering plants at the time. 
this coincided with a radiation in insects, especially pollinating forms, carnivorous mammals that could supplement their diets with these abundant new plant and insect food sources, like early metatherians, may have had an advantage over purely carnivorous forms like eutriconodonts. But this still remains speculative and requires further study and fossil evidence to test more effectively. Ironically though, as the Cretaceous progressed, metatherians would later evolve into very specialised forms themselves. Perhaps the most specialised were the Stagodontids. The most famous member of this family is Didelphodon. Its name means opossum tooth, and it lived alongside T. rex and Triceratops in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana at the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago. Estimated at around a metre long and weighing 5 kilograms, it was one of the largest known Mesozoic mammals. Contrasting with its most popular, badger-like appearance in Walking with Dinosaurs, its foot bones are indicative of a semi-aquatic lifestyle, perhaps similar to an otter. Its skull showed huge canines and broad premolars, indicative of a hypercarnivore capable of crushing tough prey with a strong bite perhaps even being a scavenger that could break bones like a hyena or the Tasmanian Devil. 66 million years ago, the Cretaceous and Mesozoic era ended with a mass extinction event which killed off the non-avian dinosaurs and many other dominant reptiles. With the proverbial slate cleared, mammals were able to grow much larger and occupy the niches left vacant by the extinction in the ensuing Cenozoic era. With that said, metatherians suffered major losses at the end of the Cretaceous, with many groups becoming extinct, most likely due to many of them being highly specialised and unable to adapt to the rapid changes to the global ecosystem. A handful of lineages did persist through to the Cenozoic. One family that successfully crossed the boundary were the Herpetotheriids. It is debated whether they form a natural group or a succession of species gradually leading to true marsupials. They were once classified as marsupials and are thought to be very similar to opossums in appearance and ecology as arboreal generalist omnivores, but are now thought to be more basal than them. The oldest genus, Maastrichtidelphis, shares its name origin with the Maastrichtian stage of the Cretaceous when it lived 66 million years ago in the Netherlands, representing the first instance of metatherians in Europe, most likely arriving from North America. Having colonised North America, Asia and Europe by the beginning of the Cenozoic, they would later spread to Africa by the Oligocene Epoch roughly 33 million years ago, thanks to the African tectonic plates moving northwards towards Eurasia. The morphologically similar family, Paradectidae, also reached Europe via North America, either in the Paleocene Epoch or the Late Cretaceous, depending on the validity of as yet undescribed Cretaceous-aged fossils referred to the family. Both they and the Herpetotheriids persisted until the early Miocene Epoch, roughly 20 million years ago, making them the last metatherians in Europe and Africa, and the last metatherians in North America until the arrival of the opossums roughly 3 million years ago. During the Middle Eocene Epoch, roughly 43 million years ago, sea levels were much higher, and in what is today Anatolia in Turkey, the highland region known as the Pontide Terrain formed a small island in the ancient Tethys Sea between Eurasia and Africa called Balkanatolia. Isolated from other land masses, it developed its own unique fauna. Here lived an incredibly obscure and only very recently recognised group of metatherians that I only learned about when researching for this video, the Anatolia delphiids. The type genus Anatolia delphis was only named in 2017 and it was an opossum-like carnivore the size of a cat, possibly capable of biting through bone. Another genus, Orhaniaea, named in 2023 after Orhaniae in Turkey, has been speculated to have eaten tough prey such as snails, showing that this strange family occupied various niches on their small Turkish island. As the Eocene progressed and the climate cooled, sea levels dropped, causing the ancient island of Balkanatolia to form a bridge between Europe and Asia, allowing competitors to disperse into the region and likely outcompeting the native fauna. 
Much like today, placental mammals were extremely diverse, having diversified fairly rapidly after the Cretaceous extinction, and could be found practically all over the globe by around 45 million years ago, including the skies and oceans. Whilst most Cenozoic metatherians were minor components of their ecosystems in the Northern Hemisphere, things were quite different on the Southern continents. Whilst marsupials are most famously associated with Australia, their origins do not lie there, but rather in South America, which is a marsupial hotspot in its own right. It is still unclear whether marsupials originated in the late Cretaceous, as is suggested by molecular studies, or in the early Paleocene, as they are only known uncontroversially from fossils from the Cenozoic. What is known is that metatherians reached South America from North America within this time frame, likely by island hopping and or rafting. South America was not yet connected to North America as it is today, but was instead connected to Antarctica on its southern tip as part of the ancient landmass Gondwana. The rocks of the Santa Lucia formation in Tupampa, Bolivia, dated to the early Paleocene, 64 million years ago, preserve a crucial point in the evolution of South American mammals, and in fact, mammals in general. It preserves a warm, humid, tropical rainforest ecosystem with many rivers and ponds. One metatherian found here, the mouse-sized Pucadelphus, was thought to have either been social or at least lived in close approximation to others of its own kind in burrows near a river. Something unknown in modern marsupials, over 30 individuals have been uncovered within close proximity, thought to have been drowned and preserved by a flood infilling their burrows. Teopampa is significant as it preserves the oldest known fossils of true marsupials. Of the groups of marsupials recognised today, it is thought that the first group to branch off was the order Didelphomorphia, aka the opossums, that are widespread throughout the Americas today. They are not to be confused with these similar looking possums found only in Australia, which can be considered true possums. They are thought to have originated in the early Paleocene, or possibly even the late Cretaceous, in South America. Discerning the exact origins of the opossums is difficult, as due to the perceived similarities in their skeletal features and teeth, many Cretaceous-aged mammals were classified as didelphids, the family within didelphomorphs that includes all opossum species alive today, but most of them have been reclassified as non-marsupial metatherians. This also led to assumptions that opossums may be close to the ancestral appearance of metatherians, if not the vast majority of Mesozoic mammals, as arboreal generalist omnivores. This issue is confounded by the fact that in a paper from 2014, using molecular clock data, the family Didelphidae was estimated to have originated in the late Oligocene epoch, anywhere from 28 to 24 million years ago and the oldest known definitive didelphids, and by extension didelphomorphs, are known from the early Miocene epoch, roughly 23 million years ago, suggesting there is a long ghost lineage of didelphomorphs stretching back to the Paleocene, if not the Cretaceous. This leads us into the next order of marsupials, the Porci tuberculates. Today, they are represented by the seven species of shrew opossums, an obscure and poorly understood group found only in the alpine forests of the Andes Mountains in South America. They are all nocturnal omnivores that favour carnivory and are members of a single family, seen less today, but were more diverse in the past. This group is also thought to have originated in the early Paleocene, but the oldest known members date to the late Paleocene, roughly 56 million years ago. The Porci tuberculates would go on to diversify into four recognised families, three of which are now extinct. During the early Oligocene, around 33 million years ago, South America drifted north, opening the Drake Passage and creating the Southern Ocean as it detached from Antarctica, becoming an island continent with its own unique fauna. Marsupials shared the continent with the last group of non-marsupial metatherians, the Sporacidonts. The genus Myulestes, meaning river thief, found at Teopampa, represents the oldest known sporacidont, 
It was the size of a rat at roughly 18 centimeters long and would have looked somewhat like an opossum and was similarly arboreal, but its teeth were indicative of a carnivore. It was likely a predator of lizards, amphibians and other small mammals. This carnivorous lifestyle would come to define the order Sporacidonta, as they became South America's main carnivorous mammals, filling the hypercarnivore niche otherwise occupied by placentals on other continents. Their early evolution is very hazy, as most species are only known from a few fossil teeth and bones. Something noteworthy is that the genus Callisto, named after Callisto from Greek mythology, discovered in the Lumbrera Formation in Salta, Argentina, is dated to the Middle Eocene, roughly 47 million years ago. Despite its old age, it is considered very derived, speculated to have been a weasel-like predator, with forelimbs designed for running and digging for burrowing prey. This suggests that Sporacidonts had already massively diversified by this time, but little fossil evidence is known. Callisto was a member of the family Proborhyenidae, of which the type genus Proborhyena was the largest known sporacidont, with estimates ranging from 100 to 600 kilograms. Its skull was short and had huge canines. It lived during the Oligocene Epoch from 33 to 24 million years ago in Argentina, Bolivia and Uruguay. It was heavily built, suggesting it was not a pursuit predator and more likely ambush slow moving prey, such as the diverse range of placental ground sloth and armadillo species, or South American native ungulates that are now extinct and honestly deserve their own video talking about them. Another sporacidont family were the Hathiocynids. These were generally small, long snouted predators of small vertebrates. The genus Cladocictis, which means branch weasel, lived in the early Miocene of Argentina and Chile, and as its name suggests, looked and probably acted much like a weasel with the long snout of a fox. Another sporacidont family, the Borhyenidae, was once a very species-rich group, but papers from the 2000s and 2010s have shuffled many sporacidonts into different groups. The type genus Borhyena, meaning strong hyena, lived during the early Miocene epoch from 20 to 15 million years ago in Argentina and Chile. As its name suggests, it was thought to have filled a similar niche to placental hyenas as bone-crushing predators and scavengers, with their short and heavily built skulls and robust teeth to extract nutritious bone marrow. Bite marks have been found on the skulls of some individuals indicative of intraspecific aggression in Borhyena, not dissimilar to the modern Tasmanian devil. The last group of sporacidonts are the most famous, the Thylacosmilids. They represent one of the most remarkable cases of convergence evolution, as they independently evolved huge saber canine teeth from placental carnivores such as Smilodon. Much like them, they had weak jaw muscles, but an incredibly wide gape and strong neck muscles, suggesting they used their necks to thrust their sabers into prey. They differed, however, in that their lower jaws had long, deep flanges, thought to have protected their canines when not in use. The best known member was the type genus Thylacosmilus. Its name means pouch knife, and it lived in the late Miocene and early Pliocene epochs from 9 to 3 million years ago in Argentina. It was the most derived member of its family and had the most extreme adaptations. The roots of its canines extended up the front of the skull and even caused the orbits to diverge, limiting its binocular vision. It was the most heavily built and based on this has been interpreted as subduing prey to the ground before delivering the killing blow with its sabers and powerful neck. Another, more outlandish interpretation of its ecology has been made by paleoartist Hodari Nundu, who I highly recommend you check out on DeviantArt and YouTube. He envisioned it as similar to an anteater, using its sabers to break into insect nests. This is purely speculative though, and hopefully further study and fossil finds will reveal more about how this bizarre animal lived. What we can infer about it, and possibly all sporacidont, is that they lived mainly in forested environments. This inference is based on the fact that they were not the only apex predators in South America during the Cenozoic. They were not mammals, but birds. 
the forest rockids, better known by their common name, terror birds, were huge, flightless birds native to South America. Greatly contrasting with the generally low-slung, short-legged sporacidonts, terror birds were tall, long-legged, fast pursuit predators. Their height and incredible eyesight would have made them well adapted to open grasslands and savanna. As the Cenozoic progressed and the global climate cooled in the build-up to the eventual ice age, the forests shrank and grasslands spread. This has been suggested as a cause for the decline of the sporacidonts in the middle of the Miocene and their eventual extinction during the Pliocene, roughly 3 million years ago, either from habitat loss and being outcompeted by terror birds, or from their preferred prey dying out from said habitat loss. Formerly, they were thought to have been outcompeted by placental carnivores arriving from North America in the Pliocene. But this seems unlikely, as sporacidonts appear to have already been extinct by the time the first placental carnivore fossils appear in South America. More on that later. Coinciding with the decline of the sporacidonts, for reasons that are still not clear, the shrew opossums also very suddenly declined in the Middle Miocene, roughly 11 million years ago, leaving only the Cenolestids. Conversely, the didelphid opossums had only been minor components in the ecosystems of South America up to that point, and this is where we see them diversify, likely taking over the niches left by the shrew opossums and sporacidonts. The modern otter-like lutrine opossums are considered the most carnivorous of the group alive today, and are thought to have originated during this time frame. One genus, Thylophorops, was the largest known opossum and was thought to have been a hypercarnivore, with evidence of it hunting and killing burrowing animals and then claiming their burrows as its own. Its reign as top dog, top opossum, was short-lived. Having been isolated from the rest of the world for roughly 30 million years, South America eventually drifted north until it collided with North America in the late Pliocene roughly 3 million years ago, forming the Isthmus of Panama. This continental collision ushered in the Great American Biotic Interchange, a huge Pan-American dispersal and mixing of species, the large killer opossums were thought to have been driven to extinction by the arrival of large placental carnivores from the north, such as saber-toothed cats, canines, and bears. Opossums were able to make the reverse trip into Central and North America, with one species, the Virginia opossum, reaching as far north as Canada. The last order of South American marsupials are the microbiotheres. Today, this ancient order has only one single species left, the Monito del Monte, which means little monkey of the forest in Spanish, as it is only found in the distinct ecoregion of the Valdivian temperate forests of Chile, where it feeds on insects and fruit. Whilst it is of course not a monkey at all, this small marsupial has huge biogeographical implications. Genetic studies of the Monita del Monte have found that it is more closely related to Australian marsupials than to other South American ones. The oldest known microbiothere was found in the Paleocene rocks of Teopampa. It was called Cassia, after Antine Cassa, near to where it was discovered. Whilst only known from a single tooth, from this we can infer that Cassia was likely a small insectivore about the size of a mouse, like its modern relative. So, if marsupials originated in South America, how did they get to Australia? The answer lies with the microbiotheres. During the early Eocene epoch, roughly 55 million years ago, we find microbiothere fossils in a very outlandish location, Seymour Island in the Antarctic Peninsula. If you recall, South America was still connected to Antarctica at this time, allowing land animals to disperse there. Contrasting strongly with its appearance today, Antarctica had a temperate to subtropical climate and hosted vast forests of Nothophagus, southern beech trees, signature plants of the ancient landmass of Gondwana, also found in South America, Australia and New Zealand. Yet another single tooth was found in the rocks of the La Mezeta formation of Seymour Island and was given the name Woodburnadon meaning Woodburn's Tooth, after Dr. Michael Woodburn, 
and its specific name, W. Casei, after Dr. Judd Case, both influential researchers of Antarctic fossil mammals. Estimated at around a kilogram in weight, it is thought to be the largest known microbiothere, and its bulky molar suggests it was a fruit eater. Today, the Manito del Monte is an important seed disperser for mistletoes, and it has been speculated that Woodburnidon may have been a disperser for southern beaches in Eocene Antarctica. They would have lived alongside other travellers from South America in these forests, such as other metatherians and placental herbivores. An interesting contemporary was Antarctodolops, known only from a partial jaw and teeth, when it was first described in 1984 by Woodburn himself, it marked the first terrestrial mammal fossil known from Antarctica. It was a member of the order Polydolopimorphia, a strange, obscure and diverse group that are variously being considered true marsupials, but are currently considered non-marsupial metatherians, with their placement on the family tree being uncertain. They lived from the Paleocene to the Pliocene, and have only been found in South America and Antarctica, and had a variety of forms. Whilst Antarctodolops was thought to have looked and behaved much like an opossum, the genus Argyrolagus, meaning silver rabbit, from Pliocene Argentina, as its name suggests, had long hopping legs like a rabbit, and likely looked similar to the modern hopping Australian marsupial, the Kultar. Their extinction, similar to the Sporacidonts, may have coincided with the progressively cooling climate of the Cenozoic. In addition to South America in the west, Antarctica was also connected to Australia in the east. It is thought that Antarctica essentially acted as a highway between these two continents for marsupials in the early Cenozoic. The strongest evidence for this theory is that the oldest known Australian marsupial is also dated to the early Eocene. Near the town of Murgon in Queensland, the Murgon fossil site preserves Australia's oldest Cenozoic mammals. Among them is Jarthia, Australia's oldest definitive marsupial, and fittingly, its name is an Aboriginal Australian word meaning elder sister. It is known from a molar and some ear and foot bones, indicating it was a small, mouse-like insectivore. The specifics of its relations to other marsupials are hard to pin down, it was placed in the clade Australodelphia, which groups microbiotheres and all Australian marsupials. But where exactly it belongs in this group is unclear. Around the boundary of the Eocene and Oligocene, roughly 34 million years ago, having been slowly rifting away since the age of the dinosaurs, much like South America, Australia detached from Antarctica, opening the Tasman Gateway. It would then drift north into the tropics towards Asia as an island continent, taking its marsupial passengers with it. Cut off from the rest of the world, marsupials would claim Australia as their own, diversifying into a staggering variety of forms. Why is it that when most continents were dominated by placentals, marsupials flourished in Australia specifically? I think that topic deserves its own video, as it is an awesome and fascinating subject. Marsupials and their metatherian kin are such an amazing group of animals, as they are truly unique, and it's sad that many of these bizarre creatures are no longer with us today. As such, it's important that we protect those that are still with us, as habitat destruction caused by human development poses a serious threat to many marsupial species, and it is therefore our responsibility to ensure we can coexist with these wonderful ancient creatures. Thank you so much for watching. Please do like the video and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Let me know what your personal favourite extinct marsupial or metatherian is in the comments below. Thank you. Bye bye now.